Okay, it works. <laughs> and welcome to the writing stream, my friends. It's Monday or Tuesday, as we like to call it sometimes. Uh, we are here once more to discuss all things science fiction, fantasy, and in, at the moment, <laughs> historical novels uh, of, of, of yesteryear. The great, the great masters of and mistresses. Is that right? <laughs> masters and mistresses. That doesn't sound right, does it? <laughs> What's you know what I mean, though. <laughs> That's, that's something that's worth consideration. Maybe we should have made that one initially. Um, you know, a, a past master. Um, what's uh, maybe if we don't? Maybe we don't need a gender-specific uh, <laughs> name for that. I mean, uh, you can't call this something a past mistress. That doesn't sound right, does it? Uh, but you know what I mean. What, 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 do we, what do we do? Can't call them, we can't kill people mistresses. That that's got all sorts of connotations that I can't definitely aren't correct. Grammatically correct. Um, I <laughs> think you're potty you mind. <laughs> Commander Zeta. Well, I suppose, yeah, I mean, past master, I mean, a master of something is someone who um, has, um, I mean, is, is master maybe uh, gender neutral then? Maybe is, is that probably, is that fair? Um, I'm just trying to think. Um, if you'd said someone was a master of something, they have mastered it. That, that's okay, isn't it? Master of the trade, not gendered. Right, okay, there we go. So we don't need to worry about mistresses tonight. Which is probably a relief to everybody involved. Excellent. <laughs> it's funny the things that you say and you go, eh, well, never mind. Anyway, welcome, my friends. Welcome on and welcome all to the writing stream uh, where we will be dispatching... Uh, Finally, uh, Jules Verne, great novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea this evening. But before we get into that, we must do the thing of the thing. Because the thing is the thing. The thing must be done. So who do we have on the stream tonight? We have... Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> we have first in the chat, Wintermute GB, of course, of course. Congratulations on being first in the chat there, Wintermute GB. It's always good to see you there. Uh, the Arrakis is here as well, fighting off the invasion of the Harkonnens. <laughs> Good to see you all still alive, I guess. Always good. Scrub Ghost and says, Morning Drew from somewhere, pushing me far in the west. Uh, <laughs> that's quite good. Uh, Commander Sea Dweller is here as well. Mad Monk Soft is here as well. Poised as ever on Wikipedia. Um, Alan as well, because uh, Alan has been providing all sorts of useful suggestions on what we might do after 20,000 leagues. Um, I mean, we have plenty of leagues to go, but... Uh, <laughs> After the leagues, uh, there may be other things to go. So we'll, we'll get onto that um, as, as time goes on. Um, uh, <laughs> I am a mis mis I'm, I'm a misfit. No, triple I misfit. However you want to pronounce that is here as well. DJ's BB is here. The Harkonnens are here. Ready to invade a racket as ever. Uh, and the Electro Raptor is here as well as well. Well, welcome. Welcome one and welcome all to the writing stream. So we are still making our way, like I said, through Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Unseen. Now, we, we've been doing some quite in-depth stuff on it, to be honest, for the last three weeks. Because it is a, it is a story, I think, that is worthy of that. Sending the Nautilus down to David Jones's locker, exactly. Uh... There's some good nautical things like that, Davy Jones's locker. I mean, <laughs> things like that. Sort of, I mean, that's, that to me is sort of Pirates of the Caribbean territory, really. But um, <laughs> I suppose it's it, it's not, is it, though? Because that, that's popularised things like that. But they, they were much, much earlier. I mean, I remember them being in Treasure Island, things like that. Um, you know, Yo-Ho-Ho -ho and a bottle. <laughs> is it a bucket of rum or a bottle of rum? I think it's a bottle of rum. A bucket of rum might be a bit much. <laughs> um wouldn't say no to a bucket of rum, but <laughs> pretty sure it's a bottle of rum. Um you know, and all things like that. Now I, I must admit, when I, I, I you know, you know, going off of the tangent for a moment, as we do, um Um Treasure Island is Robert Louis Stevenson, isn't it? Robert Robert Louis Stevenson. Um Um which I understand actually nowadays is classed as a children's book. Um I don't. I don't remember it being classed as a children's book when I was a, a children. <laughs> but um, you know, because it's got it's it's got a fair bit of violence in it, which but by today's standards, I imagine is is pretty tame. But um, but yeah, oh, yeah, people are getting shot and dying. You know, that's that's the thing. Um, and then um, yeah, I remember knives and things being thrown and 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 skeletons and dead bodies and things. So you know, it was. <laughs> For a, for a poor young lad of the 1970s, it was it was pretty darn scary. But uh, yeah, maybe maybe uh, was like giving Captain Nemo the black spot. Yeah, all those sort of things. So I presume, um, I don't know how true to the facts Robert Louis Stevenson was in Treasure Island, but all those sort of piratical type things, you know, buccaneers and mutineers and 
black spots and dead men's chests and <laughs> all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, yeah, was that was that authentic at any time? Um, it's okay when historical folks get killed. <laughs> it's it's educational. That's right. <laughs> Well, uh, I was reminded of that, that line in the Muppets, actually, when they do the Christmas Carol. <laughs> it's it's all really, really spooky. When the kids get upset, nah, it's literature. <laughs> oh, it's okay then. <laughs> um, as we all know, the Muppets Christmas Carol is the, de the is the definitive telling of the uh, of Charles Dickens' the Christmas Carol. Uh, they killed with historical weapons. So it's okay. I think there were edited versions of Treasure Island's Oh, are there? Okay, so that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, things like keel hauling. I mean, that's that was that was bad, wasn't it? And presumably walking the plank wasn't all that much better. All sorts of things. So I don't know how authentic some of those things are. I mean, I imagine they are authentic in in some of the details. Um, but uh, but there we are. So um, okay, so maybe there are edited versions. Uh, <laughs> it's what Charles would have wanted. <laughs> the Muppets. I, that's, see, that's that's the thing. When somebody says, "Yeah, would you like to?" Um, meet your um you know some historical author yeah if you could bring him back a historical author from the dead uh what would you what would you chat about i would definitely show the muppet christmas carol to charles dickens <laughs> just to see the look on his face <laughs> that would be awesome <laughs> uh so I, I kind of hope he'd be kind of like actually quite happy about the fact that people were still making versions of his story long after he was dead. Because, I mean, what el what author wouldn't like that, right? Uh, whether he'd be all that enthusiastic about a bunch of puppets, uh, I don't know. But uh, there we go. imagine if the puppets did Shaywood. <laughs> I, I, actually, a musical version of Shaywood would be quite interesting to see how they did it. Um, way beyond my capabilities, I'm afraid. Walking the Plank is an invention of pirate stories, is it? Ah, oh, that's a shame, because that's, that's always one of my favourite ones, where they prod you to the edge of a plank. And then um, uh, J.R.R. Tolkien wasn't keen on his book being turned into a cartoon. Now, that's, I must admit, I haven't seen that cartoon for J.R.R. Tolkin, um, Lord of the Rings, because it's kind of only the first half of Lord of the Rings, isn't it? Didn't they stop? Um, halfway through in the cartoon, they never finished it. Um, um, I don't remember it being too bad, but I mean, I haven't seen it for probably 30 years. Um, so I don't know. Um, it was so bad they stopped. I don't remember it being too bad at the time. I mean, maybe I haven't watched it since. And obviously it would pale into insignificance compared to the, uh, the feature films now that we've had. Um, Alan... <laughs> <laughs> Not before we do. The Saudi version of Thelma and Louise only lasts 10 minutes because they cut out all the scenes of women driving. <laughs> How can you even tell that story without the women driving? Um, Mad Monks, it was half animation, half real. Quite. Yes, it was, wasn't it? That's what they had real people acting out things and other bits of it were, were not. Um, musical version of Shane would get Rick Wakeman on the phone right now. I think. Um, yeah, well, I might, maybe, well, I'll have to see if I can dig it out at some point and just watch it. Um, uh, just for fun but yeah so uh, <laughs> bringing back all this from the dead and subjecting them to weird and wacky versions of their <laughs> interpretations of their work um would, would definitely be some sort of amusement i think uh quite good fun ah dear never mind never mind so um so anyway so how are we all today before we get into um twenty thousand leagues which we will crack on with, we will crack on with um rotoscoped what does that mean? I don't even understand what rotoscoping is. Um, that's the chance for Mad Monks off to get out of his Wikipedia. Um, um, oh, Rick Wakeman's Journey to the Centre of the Earth. There's quite a lot of Journey to the Centre of the Earthy type stuff, isn't there? Where, I mean, <laughs> particularly in the sort of 70s and 80s when, you know, we couldn't feel dinosaurs. So what we do is we've got a bunch of lizards <laughs> filmed the pretty close up. <laughs> and pretended they were dinosaurs um, with lots of people running in front of blue screens and green screens <laughs> uh, quite funny um, um, oh Ray Harryhausen yes yeah yeah they're <laughs> the stop motion animation those are really good actually I did enjoy those I mean yeah the classic ones with um, uh, 
is it Sinbad and um, is it Sinbad or the, the what, what's among the Golden Fleece? No, that's not Sinbad. That's um, um, oh, Jason and the Argonauts. There we are. That's that's one, isn't it? And then it, it was Clash of the Titans is the other one, isn't it? Uh, those are I think the two most famous ones for, that I can remember. I mean, they were brilliant films back then. Um, the land that time forgot. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, some good stories. See, I used to. Animating over live action, is that what rotoscoping is? Right, okay. Um, yes, classic Easter film. It was, wasn't it? It was. Um, I'd forgotten about the ladder that I forgot. <laughs> that's because it was six million years BC, Frank. That's, that's how long ago it was. Um, okay, so rotoscope is tracing over real figures on film. See, I could probably do rotoscoping then. <laughs> I wouldn't call it retroscoping. I'd call it cheating. <laughs> when I was young, this is Frank Meyer. Yeah. <laughs> lizards in the mall. It was all lizards, wasn't it? Unless they were Ray Harryhausen's um, animated monsters. I must admit, I do remember as a child, I mean, the Jason and the Argonauts thing, the scariest scene in Jason and the Argonauts. You know when it's that, um, when they get that huge... Colossus is it Achilles or at least the animated the, the great big bronze statue that comes alive and they have to take out his heel and it all these liquid gushes out I remember the first time I saw that as a as a yeah, young man being utterly terrified um yeah that this huge mechanical beast would come alive and then turn around and regard you and then like, I'm going to destroy you like, oh my god <laughs> but you know it's it's amazing actually how you, when you watch things now you need the special effects to be believable otherwise you're just kind of like really whereas back in I mean when you just weren't used to it Talos that was it or Talos um, except you, it, it kind of ought to have been Achilles but it was called Talos wasn't it the statue of Talos or something anyway um, and you weren't allowed to pinch any of his stuff you know despite the fact the door was unlocked um yeah but i remember being t i remember being completely kind of whoa you know like that yeah really really kind of intimidated by it yeah it's funny nowadays you look at the special effects they go how do we ever how were we ever impressed by this those kind of special effects but we were we were it's funny it's funny how things go on um edgar rice burrows yes well we ought to talk about edgar rice burrows at some point as well we need to have a think about what we're going to read from uh, weeks going on i'm hoping to have a, an author a guest author speaker at some point in the next few weeks as well so we might have to slot that in as well but we'll see how that goes um but yes we need we will need a book for um uh, we will need a book for next week as well now that we've uh jumping through twenty thousand leagues um but anyway let's get on with captain nemo and see <laughs> see where we got to now um we'd spent a bit of time on the scene setting with captain nemo uh, let me just scroll that in a little bit so it's not interrupting the chat Ooh, there's another window behind let's get rid of that um the mine was the yeti on doctor oh doctor who was terrifying as a child actually i remember bleak seven being scary as well as a child i think i watched that on my own that was one of those kind of hide behind the covers a <laughs> black and white tv um even even as a child, the Blake the Blake Seven theme music was intimidating. I mean, imagine being intimidated by a piece of music. But you know, I, I, I had a very sheltered childhood. Um, but I remember being quite awed by even the theme tune of Blake Seven. Um, it was sort of slightly unnerving or slightly edgy. I don't know, maybe it was something like that. But um, I do remember being kind of intimidated by things like that. Um, but. Um, it, it, um, it's a lovely tune it still you know stirs me now when i listen to it it does feel like going out you know into space and stuff uh both that and the original original star trek theme so um um from waffle to the book in under 50 minutes it's got to be a record this evening. well we're not there yet <laughs> i've got through all the rest of the chat <laughs> so it's not gonna be a record breaking one today um the screenplay for the land that time forgot was written by michael Mook. was it um now hang on, the land that time forgot is that the one? Is that the one where they're in a navy submarine or a World War Two submarine or a Nazi submarine or something? Um, and they go through a tunnel under the Arctic and then they emerge into like a tropical world. Is that is that is that land that time forgot? I can't remember now. It's one of those. It's a sort of B movie ish kind of sort of premise, isn't it? Um, oh, it's a. 
No, the plat isn't it a plateau? Wasn't that the um, but isn't that the book version? Isn't that the Edgar Rice Burroughs book version, which isn't the same? Um, they were very loosely connected, I think, the film and the books. The book, as I recall, is a plateau, which you have to scale to get to. But in the book, in the film, it's they go underneath the Arctic to get there. Is it a German U-boat? I'm just trying to remember. Yeah, I think it is. I think that's the film version. Um, and then there's dinosaurs and <laughs> lizards, obviously. Um, so uh, Blake Seven had good stories, but was poorly produced with dodgy sets of effects. <laughs> yes, that's definitely true. I did like the Liberator, though. I did like the Liberator on Blake Seven. Um, I mean, the uh, teleport effect was was very very BBC, wasn't it? Where it just went wobbly, <laughs> faded out. Um, but um, Mad, Monk, Mad Monks of says the film that freaked me out was American Werewolf in London. I don't think I've actually seen that. Um, so I probably need to add that. I have, I have heard of it. I don't think I've actually seen it. I might need to add that to my list. Um, uh, but yeah, the Liberator, very, very cool spaceship. I mean, totally impractical spaceship, obviously. I mean, it was, it was basically three prongs of a light bulb on the back, but somehow <laughs> that was made to look pretty cool. Uh, so I do like the Liberator, actually. Um, and I like the, I must admit, I did like, and I appreciated right from the start, that the crew of the Liberator were not the crew of the Enterprise, right? So yeah, where's the Enterprise? Everyone is very collegiate and the Federation has, you know, has excellent morals and upstanding and is basically the good guys throughout the entire universe. Uh, except when the Admirals come on board, the Admirals are always tainted for some reason in Star Trek. Um, you know, the crew of the Enterprise were moral, upstanding good guys who would always fight the good fight and, you know, believed in everything and then, whereas the crew of the liberator were not you know they were a bunch of misfits and criminals that had kind of been thrown together for a common purpose and i liked that i liked the fact that um avon and blake would always argue and villa was a coward and um there was the other who was the telepath lady um kelly you know she would always think things and <laughs> stuff would happen and um yeah the rest of the crew would turn up and some people actually got killed you know gan got killed sorry spoilers there for <laughs> I think at the end of season one of Blake Seven, but you know, actual main characters got killed. That that was that was pretty impressive. Um, so um, um, so yeah, so yeah, so um, Commander Sea Dweller must have been cho uh, getting choosy teenage and never really got into Blake Seven. Probably spent more time in the pub chasing girls. Yeah, so you know, that must be a little bit older than me because I definitely wasn't chasing girls when Blake Seven came out. <laughs> the guy even knew what a girl was at that age. Uh, <laughs> uh, Firefly was the unofficial sequel of Blake 7 mm, yeah, some similarities I think yeah um, Windview GB says Firefly was garbage how can you say that it was good right Windview GB banned how <laughs> I can't say that Firefly had some excellent lines in it that's why I liked it um <laughs> things like uh, things like <laughs> It should be in a science fiction novel. Dude, we live on a spaceship. <laughs> it's like, yep, yeah, I enjoyed that. I mean, um, who's the writer behind that? It's the same guy who did Buffy. Um, who's got, he's, he's occasionally got himself um, into hot water, hasn't he, for his carrying on, as, as a lot of people do. I'm always thinking. Joss Whedon, yeah. So I did, I do like his, di his dialogue driven characters. Um, so, um, you know, yeah, I'll give Joss Whedon plus points for his dialogue. His, his dialogue is good, but um so that's quite good um very easily says winter beach review it's unwatchable no see i liked it i i did i did genuinely like firefly a lot serverland was sexy as hell oh she was she was just evil in a weird sort of sort of cat-like kind of jaguar sort of a way I, i'm not quite sure what to make of serverland my favorite character was actually su lin who was in is it su lin or su lin su lin um who was in the last Last season, I think. Glennis Barber, I think it, the actress. Um, she just went around with a gun all the time. So, hey, <laughs> I, I was young, <laughs> easily oppressed. Um, but there we go. Um, right. <laughs> we should get on with Charles Verne, who's probably kind of waiting there in the ether somewhere. Okay, right. Are they ever going to talk about my book? Um, <laughs> the preacher's description of the special level of hell reserved for lawyers and people who talk at the theatre. <laughs> That's right. It's my very favourite gun. <laughs> I call it Vera. 
<laughs> Sulin, that was it. Sulin. Um, or Sul Sulin. I'm not quite sure. Well, anyway. Um, she, she and Avon got on very well because she was kind of like a super sharp shooter, wasn't she? Um, and uh, Avon was like the you know, technical leader genius. He was, was good at maths, so I quite liked him as well. He was very sardonic, was, was Avon. I liked his cutting wit. He was <laughs> one of my favourite characters. I'm not indispensable. <laughs> and I'm not going. <laughs> I think that's what it is. What is it, what's the line? I've got to get it now. What's Avon's best line? Um, I'm going to look it up. Blake 7. Uh, I'm not something... I'm not... Um, uh, what was it? Uh, I'm going to look it up. I'm not going. <laughs> I can't remember which episode it in. There we go. I'm not expendable, I'm not stupid, and I'm not going. <laughs> That's just a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant line. Uh, my favourite piece of dialogue from Blake 7, that is. Um, Scorpio, yes. That's right, that was, the, that was the rubbish ship they had after Liberator, wasn't it? Um, by the way, Liberator was built around a microphone. Oh, was it a microphone? What, with light in the end? Um, excellent. Uh, <laughs> So easy to get you drew off a tangent. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. It is indeed. Well, I mean, that's the point of this stream, is it? <laughs> you don't have to take anything seriously. Uh, right, that's enough. Right. It's 20, 21 minutes into the stream. It's about time we started doing 20,000 leagues on the sea. Do you know what I did there? So we've gone past 20, 20, we're now at 21. Back to 20,000 leagues on the sea. Right, anyway, so um, we had spent a bit of a time. Okay, so this book spends. We're only here for the waffle. <laughs> It's funny with them all flashy lights, computers look... Yeah, see, I must have... I mean, here's a funny story about that, which is not Lloyds of London related, <laughs> just before anybody shoots me. Um, although there is a... Fun, no. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, when when I was a kid, of course, you know, I watched Blake 7, and I watched Star Wars, and I watched Star Trek, and all of these, like, futuristic films that were basically portraying how computers were going to be in the future and even in the contemporary um, near future fiction of the time computers were all every single computer was a collection of flashing lights wasn't it I mean when you look at it now you think well why did that ever make any sense because <laughs> who can who can determine anything from a, like a massive grid of flashing lights right uh, how on earth do you get any useful information about... I mean, all the computers were the same, weren't they? They were like a, a may, maybe like 20 by 10 or 30 by 20 grid of flashing lights. I'm just like, what does that tell you? It's just lots of flashing lights doing flashing stuff, sometimes in different colours, sometimes not. Um, and you Whereas as a kid, I thought, wow, one of these days when I'm grown up, I'll be able to work in such a cool place where I'll just be surrounded by flashing lights. Um, and, you know, in, in the early 70s, all the all the high tech computers um, had <laughs> had tape players, didn't they? <laughs> Which were spinning backwards and forwards, you know, shuffling tape from one reel to the other, uh, doing important looking stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, by the time I'd actually grown up and I got my first job, all of those computers were gone. In fact, they probably never existed at all. Um, and computers were really, really boring. <laughs> just little terminals with keyboards in front of them. Uh, and you had to type stuff into them. It's just, it was very, very, very disappointed by how the evolution of computers went after the after the lights of the 1970s. Um, so, uh, so yeah. Um, yeah, reality sucks, unfortunately. <laughs> Anyway, so 20,000 Leagues on the Sea, we had spent a lot of time going through the early parts of this book and it was worth doing actually because I felt this was quite a good setup and, it, and, it, and, it's, and it's a book that stands up um, reasonably well to that. I mean, it, Jules Verne does spend a lot of time doing the, oh, is it a sea monster? Is it a sea monster? Is it a sea monster? Oh, actually, it's not a sea monster, it's a machine. Um, <laughs> Which is, which is, uh, by modern standards, kind of like, really, we've got it. <laughs> you figured that out in the first chapter, Mr. Vern. Um, but I'm not sure people of the time necessarily would have done. Um, because obviously this is written at the end of the 18th century. And, and a knowledge of what was possible in the art of, you know, or what was even vaguely possibly possible in the future, 
in terms of nautical equipment, I'm not sure would necessarily have been known. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, um, whilst to modernise, maybe that takes quite a long time to get to the revelation. It does sort of set itself up reasonably well. And I like the fact that they first get on a warship to go and hunt the Nautilus and it takes them a while to find it. And then when they eventually do it, they fall overboard and they're rescued by it. Um, it, it introduces the characters quite well introduces the setup quite well and then when we eventually do get to the mobilis in this wonderful name chapter here mobilis in mobili um the um you know the description of the nautilus is really actually quite well grounded in science fiction um you know so the nautilus is you know jules verne has spent some time thinking about the practicalities of a submarine which is quite good um so that's quite good. Mr. Mo Mr. Boobage says, did I even try to play Star Citizen? I have tried once since Friday <laughs> with no success so far. So I'm hoping Star Citizen sorts itself out before next Friday so I can play it again on my stream. But we'll have to wait and see. They seem to be having a few technical hitches, don't they? So we'll, we'll have to see. So, um, so grounded in science fiction. So, yeah, I mean, so there is a bit of science in there. You know, it's got thermometers and, um, you know, um, you know, depth gauges and a compass and various other bits and pieces. It's got a storm glass, which we did talk about last week as something that does, definitely does not work. Um, but it's, um, you know, so, um, you know, Jules Verne has thought about it. And I think that's what we need to have from the science fiction book. It can't just be like magicked up. Oh, it's a it's a it's an underwater submarine that just works, right? <laughs> just works because magic. He's actually thought about it. You know, the, the power uh, supply of the mobile this is electricity it's got some accumulators and piles or you know, modern words for capacitors and batteries um you know it's how it runs it has to recharge from sodium captured from seawater and, and 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 stuff like that you know he's thought through the way it works um which is quite good um and then you know eventually when it gets explained you know, he takes us on a tour of the nautilus and we see the different rooms and we see what's in there and it's powered by electricity and there's a propeller at the back and it tells us how fast it can go 50 miles an hour and you know he did a pretty good job of, of being a scientific fiction writer a science fiction writer I, I think it holds up pretty well um even in light of everything that we know now um and bear in mind back then electricity would have been a pretty scary and new phenomena to most people most people wouldn't have understood how it worked it would have been close to magic anyway to, to a lot of people um you know electricity as a household normality was uh, was many decades away um back then um for for the vast majority of people particularly in the uk i don't know about other countries but um you know it took a while I mean, and, and so we see this quite a lot in the literature of the time that electricity is like the who you know uh, you know <laughs> the same way kind of nowadays we talk about quantum this and quantum that um to make it sound like futuristic and cool because we don't have a quantum this and a quantum that yet so if we put that in there automatically makes it science fiction electricity was that thing at the end of the, <laughs> end of the 19th century um so it kind of it kind of fits fits and if you kind of translate it um quite good um yeah the electrophone of the so we'll get to things like that so um so there's been a lot of setup and you know there's so you know there's this wonderful submarine that's basically terrorizing and the character of nemo has been quite interesting you know, he's he's got some issue with people on land and it, and it seems like his description of uh, captain nemo who has to be i feel one of the great literary characters of all time captain nemo most people um you know, most people do, um, you know, in, in literary circles, particularly science fiction circles, will not, you know, can't have not heard of Captain Nemo. You know, he's kind of one of those characters. Oh, Captain Nemo. Yeah, yeah, everyone knows who Captain Nemo is because, you know, he's a famous literary character. Um, yeah. And even if they don't know the story of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, they will be familiar with him because he's just one of those guys. Um, and... Um, Anyway, so there's there's a lot of stuff that happens in um, in the rest of the story. But what what Jules Verne kind of does is he um, he does little set pieces. This is this is a very Jules Verne kind of thing. He does little, each chapter is a little bit of a, um, a mini adventure. And bear in mind that these sort of things were um, episodic in nature. So this is kind of like 
And, and, and I think I'm right in saying each chapter was published as a pamphlet one after another over a course of several weeks. So, you know, you'd wait for the next bits to come out, as it were, rather than having the entire story in one go. Um, so, um, um, you know, and the and the captain, you know, the captain, you know, the moody captain or the moody commander or the moody, you know, leader, you know, you know trapped in his solitude for reasons. Uh, surrounded by classical literature and uh, or you know, classical music or something is a is a thing that is um, um, repeated time and time again. Um, you know, sometimes mixed mixed up, of course, with uh, Captain Ahab from um, you know from um, Moby Dick. But um, Captain Nemo, Captain Ahab have quite a lot of similarities, right? You know, they're they're fairly obsessed about who they are. They're very dynamic characters who are very um, intense very focused on whatever it is that they're doing so um you know so um yeah captain picard had an echo of captain ahab in um in that episode of the borg in the the, the film i can't remember which one it was now you know so there's a there's an angle there you know you've always you've got um i tell you who captain nemo uh, is like in slightly more modern science fiction if you remember the 1979 disney's black hole which had captain reinhardt um that was that he was quite a uh, he was quite a Captain Nemo -y type. <laughs> um, so there's there's yeah and and the Wrath of Khan you know so even Khan from Star Trek you know he's he's always quoting uh, bits of bits of Shakespeare and Latin at people and the and quite often the Klingons on Star Trek as well they're quoting Shakespeare as well. <laughs> you haven't heard Shakespeare until you've heard it in the in the original Klingon apparently you know so there's a lot of literary things. That, that that echo back to this story that you know we still have um you know quite often you'll see a captain of a spaceship and he'll always have a collection of old books on his on his shelf uh <laughs> you know so there's things like that so um yeah if you haven't seen the black hole uh it's worth i mean it's it's not a great film um by any stretch of the imagination but it's not bad but, you know, particularly by the standards of the time, and 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 you know, look at the captain in that, and you'll you'll definitely get Captain Nemo vibes. Um, so, are Penguin retconning the title of the White Whale book for modern sensibilities? <laughs> Who knows what they're going to do next? Who knows? Um, I surrender my nerd card. I can't remember the black hole. Oh, you can't remember the black hole. Star Trek First Contact the Literary Editor, well done. Uh, so yeah, so um, it's kind of a way to, it's a bit of a trope now to establish your character as having a bit of an attitude problem, is that you make it, um, <laughs> you make them like classical books and classical music and quote Shakespeare. <laughs> so clearly they're a badass because they quote Shakespeare. Um, uh, Real Martigan says the Maximilian robot was as scary as Bungary as a kid. Yeah, so it was an odd, children's film actually so minor spoilers for the black hole um um there's a there's basically a massive killer robot on the ship and it's got it's got hands hasn't it that turn into blades and they spin <laughs> like that yeah really sharp blades um there is a point where one one of the characters i can't remember who he is what he's, i think it was anthony no um somebody relatively famous who you, who you wouldn't expect to be in a science fiction film. Um, I, can't remember the, I can't remember the actor's name now. Anyway, basically the robot comes towards him and he holds up a book. The robot just drills straight through the book with his spinning, spinning blades and then just eviscerates him. It's like, this is a children's film. It's a Disney film. What were they thinking? I mean, you don't actually see any blood and guts and gore going everywhere, but it's fairly obvious what's just happened. Uh, it's like, really? I remember watching it not that long ago thinking, I don't remember that at the time. Maybe they edited it out. Um, but uh, that that was kind of weird. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, but it it wasn't a bad film. In, yeah, it wasn't a good film, but it wasn't a bad film. So it's it's worth a watch with sort of 1970s goggles on. Maybe I've blocked it from memory as a child. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so anyway, so Jules Verne does a lot of stuff here. So he, he you know, um, I mean, we can choose... Um, which chapters we have we, we take a good look at here because there are a lot so basically um, um, Professor Aranax, Conseil and Ned Land get get a tour of various different places so they they do an underwater um, 
exploration um, of you know strolling the plains of the sea uh, they visit underwater water forest they go through the Pacific um, they uh, <laughs> it's quite an interesting one here with the lightning bolts that's worth having a look at um, they find a you know a massive gem a pearl in a, in a huge um, uh, clam uh, there's there's the pearl um, they find a tunnel under the Red Sea that connects the straight the isthmus of the Red Sea to the Mediterranean um, and then they, they go through the Mediterranean they um, go out into um, the Atlantic and I think they find the ruins of Atlantis yeah <laughs> so all sorts of stuff um, that goes on um, they have you know they have a they, they have a really bad um, you know, instant where they got stuck under the ice and they can't get out and they they start running out of air so that's quite interesting um so yeah so let's let's take a look at some of these the atlantis bit is pretty good it was anthony it was anthony perkins from psycho that's right so he got anthony poor old anthony perkins not only did he have problems in psycho that he also got eviscerated by a killer robot in deep space <laughs> so um so uh, let's have a look at the diving thing. So which which chapter is that in? So is that in Stroll in the Plains on the Water Forest? So uh, let's, let's go have a look. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay, so Stroll in the Plains. This cell, properly speaking, was the Nautilus Arsenal and wardrobe hanging from its walls. It doesn't diving outfits. Okay, so um, so again, this this de this particular one demonstrates. Um, 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 you know the technology of the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> Two crewmen came to help us put on these heavy waterproof clothes made from seamless India rubber and expressly designed to bear considerable pressures. Excellent. They were like suits of armour. <laughs> you can imagine these like really old fashioned <laughs> armour which is what was kind of, um, you know, current at the time. These clothes consisted of jackets and pants. The pants ended in bulky footwear adorned with heavy lead soles. They didn't sound, you know, so basically they are designed to weight you down. The fabric of the jacket was reinforced with copper mail that shielded the chest, protecting it from the water's pressure. I'm not sure copper is necessarily the best material for water, but there we are. Um, and these were perfected diving suits. <laughs> it was easy to see. They were far cry from such misshapen costumes such as cork breastplates, lever jumpers, seagoing tunics, barrel helmets invented in the clay in the 18th century. Uh, anyway, so they all get dressed in this stuff. And then... Um, you, they give them air-powered rifles, which is which is quite neat, uh, so they can go hunting, um, because that's what you do clearly <laughs> when you're a nineteenth-century gent. You you can't go off for a stroll unless you've got a gun, uh, <laughs> which does does sort of put it in picture as well. Um, so the Nautilus descends to ten meters of water, and we're going to depart. So um, how do we how do we set out? So how do they set out? Um, um, so the boat fills with water, uh, or the room that they're in fills with water, um, and then um, um, a side door opens on the uh, sorry, a second door opens on the Nautilus, and uh, an instant later they're treading on the bottom of the sea, and they go they go for a wander, um, and then um, they're about thirty feet below the ocean. Now I don't know much about diving at all. In fact, I don't know anything about diving. Let's be honest. Um, so yes, the word scuba, which I st uh, understand stands for something, doesn't it? Scuba, self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. Is that right? Um, <laughs> I think that's about it. So yeah, so, so Commander Sea Dweller is our expert here. So I don't know if you can see things uh, at 30 feet underneath the water um, or not, but um, um, he can see objects 100 metres away, which sounds a bit keen. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, maybe that's true. So you can, says so uh, so media. Okay, good. Um, so they, they wander around. I'm not quite sure how they're getting their air here. Uh, does it does it say? Uh, ah, hang on. They've got a rape corral device, which presumably is, is, is the breathing thing. Um, 30 feet is not very far. Okay, so about 100 metres sounds like quite a long way. Um, I'm not sure you could, can you see 100 meters underwater that sounds a bit keen depends on the water i suppose um to be fair the state of the art in property deep sea diving isn't far advanced from what jewel was imagined so yeah anyway so he's got a he's got an air breathing apparatus and he's got the suit you know so that kind of makes sense they've got some lights um and um and they anyway they're walking across some sand 
and um, you know there's lots of colors and there's lots of things so he's, he's, it's quite a nice painting description of um, um, you know, for, for things. Um, anyway, so they, they, they start off by doing some good sciencey stuff. They start examining things. And there's some, some nice description. I mean, I've got no idea. I mean, Commander C12 will tell us um, uh, how accurate any of this is. Um, it does sound like a bit of a list, to be honest. <laughs> it's 20,000 things under the sea. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff. Jules were definitely had to think about Americans, though, didn't he? The, the plains of sand were followed by a bed of that viscous, viscous slime Americans call ooze. So, not the civilised nations of the world call it viscous slime, but no, those Americans, just ooze. <laughs> Get the feeling Jules Verne was a bit sniffy about Americans. So apologies for all the Americans on the stream. It's a bit weird, that one. Um... Anyway, so then there's then there's a lot of stuff about this and there's a lot of stuff about that, which goes on for quite some time. Um, um, and, and there's a good joke in there. Ned's joke when someone says they'll kill it for the sake of science and he replies, nope, for the sake of the dinner table. Um, so anyway, some nice sort of pictures. Anyway, they've got their guns, so they're basically going on a hunt. Um, just let most of the descriptions go. They've all been updated 100 years later. Um, um, so... Um, we reached a depth of 100 metres, by which point we were undergoing a pressure of 10 atmospheres. No idea if that's correct, but it sounds like it might be about right. Um, as for the exhaustion bound to accompany a two-hour stroll with such unfamiliar trappings, it was nil. Helped by the water, my movements were executed with startling ease. I'm not sure I believe that at all. <laughs> um, moving around in a massive, great, big, heavy suit for two hours, and you're not tired? Mm. Okay, so 100 meters is 10 atmospheres. Okay, so I mean, poor old Jules Verne is doing, is doing his, uh, is doing his, um, um, is doing his science fairly well, which is which is good. Um, 200 meters is about the limit of how far light can travel through very clear water. Says Haunted Loaf. If you're bringing the torch, 100 meters. Okay, so okay, we'll give it, we'll give it to him. Um, anyway, there's a nice, there's a nice um, forest now, um, and a lot of this is basically a tour of stuff that um, 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 you know of, of, of underwatery stuff um, there's a meter high spider ready to eat him uh, Captain Nemo is ready uh, to deal with it um, and so and maybe there's worse things deeper on down in the ocean so who knows um, and they're 150 meters down um, I knew the sun's raising the clearer seas could reach no deeper so i mean it, it, it even if it isn't 100 percent accurate it gives you the flavor of it so um you know it 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 kind of holds together i think um i don't know what a marine quadruped is an enhydra never heard of that is that is that is that is that a thing <laughs> Diving watches have luminous stars now. Yes, well, that's true. Um, is there any mention of, and would it apply here, actually? Is it, is it, um, is there um, any mention of um, nitrogen poisoning, the bends, things like that, and not coming up from pressure? I, I don't know what they're breathing, of course. I don't think it mentioned that. Um, uh, my tank's current air supply seemed to be quite low in oxygen, he says. <laughs> just, just to kind of figure it out. Um, Uh, so what's happening here? So okay, so sharks turn up as well. Um, so there's lots of things. Okay, so not in this book. It doesn't try that hard. Okay, so they, you know they presumably are breathing air, in which case it might have become a problem. But there we go. Um, if the suits are pressurized, then I think the bends would factor in. Okay, now that makes sense as well. So um, uh, it depends on the conditions. So it's not entirely clear, but he, he does a pretty good job. He does a, he does a good pretty good job of that kind of thing. So let's skip on to. Um, uh, the lightning bolts because this is this is quite interesting um so they've they've gone ashore for a bit um and um i'm not quite sure what they were doing ashore but anyway they were they were they were eating some food as you do they probably shot something and they're eating it and then um basically <laughs> some savages turn up um head for the skiff 
I say the movie towards the sea. Um, and, it, and it was essential to beach retreat because some 20 natives armed with bows and slings appeared barely 100 paces off on the outskirts of a thicket that masked the horizon to our right. Um, um, and the skiff was aground 10 fathoms away from us. I can't remember how much a fathom was, but it wasn't as much as we thought it was, was it? Um, so Ned Land, always thinking of his stomach, um, doesn't leave his provisions behind and grabs his big entire <laughs> pig under his arm. His kangaroos on the other. Not quite sure where they were to have pigs and kangaroos in the same place. Um, <laughs> scampered off with respectable speed. Um, anyway, so they, they they stick all the all the all the. Um, a fathom was six feet. Okay, so sixty feet away, not too bad. Um, anyway, so we hadn't gone two cable lengths with a hundred sandwiches howling and gesticulated into the water up to the waists. Um, and everybody on the Nautilus seems to be entirely relaxed about this, and there's nobody there. Uh, so twenty minutes later, they board the ship. And the hatches were open. And after more in the skiff, we entered the Nautilus interior. Um, and they, they basically go to tell Captain Nemo, by the way, there's a whole bunch of really <laughs> angry savages outside. Um, Did you have a happy hunt, says Captain Nemo? Uh, we brought back a horde of bipeds whose proximity worries me. <laughs> um, Glenn Frank is here. Dang daylight savings change in the US. Missed the show, tuned in an hour early and then forgot. An hour later. Uh, on average, you're exactly spot on, then, Glenn. <laughs> um. <laughs> uh, and they, so the US and UK changed clocks on different days. Yeah, I don't think ours is due to the end of the month, is it? We've got another couple of weeks before the UK goes. Um, anyway, we've done Jules Verne insulting the Americans already, Frank, so you haven't missed anything. You'll be fine. Uh, something about ooze and slime, but don't worry about it. <laughs> Side comments, says Command Seedwell. It takes saturation divers longer to decompress than it takes to get back from the moon. Does it really? Uh, <laughs> missed all the American abuse. Yeah, there'll probably be some more. I mean, it's Jules Verne. So we'll find out. Um, anyway, so there's a bunch of savages outside. Um, savages, Captain Nemo replied in an ironic tone. You set foot on one of the shores of this globe, Professor, and you're surprised to find savages there. Where aren't there savages? And besides, are they any worse than men elsewhere? <laughs> this is getting all philosophical. <laughs> um, uh, but Captain, speaking for myself, sir, I've encountered them everywhere. Uh, well, if you don't want them to welcome aboard the Nautilus, you'd better take some precautions. Easy, Professor. No cause for alarm. Well, there are quite a large number of these natives. What's your count? At least a hundred. And then Captain Nemo starts boasting. Well, even though there were a hundred of the damn things, we haven't got anything to worry about. Um, and then he starts playing the keyboard, as you do in times of crisis. Um, this is an interesting one from a musical point of view. Uh, the captain's fingers then ran over the instrument's keyboard. I noticed that he only touched the black keys, which gave his melodies a basically Scottish colour. Now, I've... <laughs> I've I... You know a bit of Scottish music, and I'm pretty sure that black <laughs> that uh, Scottish music isn't entirely limited to just the black keys on the keyboard. Uh, let's see, that's some, a curious analysis of Scottish music. Oh, it's just using the black keys, uh, which is just odd. I don't know. That was really weird. I know that. I mean, I know the bagpipes are pretty limited, but um, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> just the black keys. Okay, um. <laughs> he's now he's now okay he's now even going to the Scottish. So he's had he's 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 he's, he's ticked off the Americans. Now the Scots are coming in for a bit of Jules Verne's ire. There we go. Uh. <laughs> anyway, so um, I climbed on the platform. Anyway, so I'm not quite sure what happens here. So the, the natives are coming to the Nautilus, and then they seem to be entirely relaxed about them. It doesn't mention that they've closed the hatch. Um, but anyway, um, for several hours I was left to myself. So presumably the natives are sort of hanging around outside, hoping that um, that they can find a way in. But um, I don't know. Um, the night passed without mishap. No doubt the Papuans had been frightened off by the mere sight of the Nautilus. Um, which doesn't make a great deal of sense because it says it actually. It says here, look, because our hatches stayed open, offering easy access to the Nautilus interior. Um, Anyway, so the next morning, there's, not, there's now five or six hundred of the natives all hanging around. Um, and um, 
so um you know so they're you know um generally they were naked i mean it's outrageous appalling behavior from the natives there was even women among them dressed from hip to knee in grass skirts held up by belts made of vegetation um and then they're starting to get close to the nautilus um and anyway so um you know some words are said and not much is not much is going on um and um uh, what about these savages, says Conseil? Uh, with all due respect to Master, they don't strike me as being very wicked, apart from they're surrounding the Nautilus and chanting at them. Um, they're cannibals, even so, my boy. A person can be both a cannibal and a decent man, Conseil replied, <laughs> slightly curiously. Um, uh, so, anyway. Uh, so, anyway, so there's, you know, it's set it up for quite a confrontational scene here and then. <laughs> It sort of defuses it for a bit, uh, which is a bit strange, you know, and they start talking about <laughs> different types of mollusks, as you do. Um, so, um, um, anyway, when when suddenly, I mean, one of the artifacts they're looking at, they, they a stone hurled by one of the islands whizzed over and shattered the valuable object in Conte's hands. Um, so, anyway, so Professor Aranax is a bit... Um, upset by this you know he's not upset by anything else but when an artifact gets destroyed Conseil pounced on his rifle and aimed at the savage uh tried to stop him but his shot went off and shattered a bracelet of amulets dangling from the island of his arm and um a shell isn't worth a human life so <laughs> points to professor aronax there um and uh, anyway it seems to um uh have kind of upset everybody a little bit um and then you start firing arrows and it all gets a little bit intense. Okay, nice picture here, by the way. Um, and so the natives are coming to basically attack the Nautilus. We've got to alert Captain Nemo, um, re-entering the hatch. Um, Am I disturbing you? I asked it out of politeness. <laughs> by the way, there's an emergency going on, but just, just checking. Um, native dugout canoes are surrounding us. In a few minutes, we're likely to be assaulted by several hundred savages. Ah, well, closing the hatches should do the trick. <laughs> and there's an electric button, so <laughs> Captain Nemo just switches off. Um, so, um, um, but um, anyway, so there, um, yeah, there's a, there's a little bit of dialogue here, basically. So, well, we're, yeah, well, we'll have to open the hatches again at some point. I don't know quite why they didn't just drive the Nautilus off. But anyway, um, it's a it's another excuse for for Jules Verne to talk about the masterfulness of electricity. Um, so eventually, um, so it, there's a bit of confusion here. You know, it seems to be um, um, you yeah, know the Nautilus has not run aground, but it's sort of stuck temporarily, um, and um, so you know they have to wait to the following day before the the um, um, um you know the nautilus can float free uh so again it takes <laughs> takes a while to get to this one um um and then you know captain nima knows what he's about to do um and professor aranex professes his entire ignorance of, of the fact that captain nemo's got a plan uh so you know captain nemo is going to open the hatches and professor aranex not really unreasonably <laughs> Says, well, yeah, but won't, 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 the, won't the savages come in if we do that? Nope, it'll be fine, says Captain Nemo. Trust me, it'll be okay. Um, and then anyway, so... Um, come along and you will see. I headed the central companion there. They very puzzled. Ned Land and Conseil watched the crewmen opening the hatches while a frightful clamour and furious shouts outside resounded. The hatch lids fell back onto the outer plating. Twenty horrible faces appear, but when the first islander laid hands on the companionway railing, he was flung backward by some invisible power. Lord knows what. Well, actually, Professor Aranax, you could have put two to two together and figured it out. And he ran off, howling in terror and wildly prancing around. Ten of his companions followed him, and all ten met the same fate. Conseil was in ecstasy, carried away by his violent instincts, and Ned Land leaped up the companionway. But as soon as his hand seized the railing, he was thrown backwards in his turn, so... Ned Land, rather stupidly, just watched ten savages grasp this metal rail and be flung off and thinks it would be a great idea to do it himself. Damnation, he exclaimed, which is definitely not what he said. Um, I've been struck by a lightning bolt. 
And these words explained everything to me. It wasn't a railing that led to the platform. It was a metal cable fully charged with the ship's electricity, which should probably be utterly lethal. But clearly <laughs> Nemo had dialed the voltage down or something. Uh, <laughs> Anyone who touched it got a fearsome shock. And such a shock would have been fatal if Captain Nemo had thrown the full current. There we go. Uh, from his equipment into this conducting cable, which would probably would have caught fire and melted. It honestly could be said that he had stripped himself and his assailants a network of electricity and no one could steer clear with impunity. Um, anyway, meanwhile, crazed with terror, the unhinged Papuans beat a retreat. And as for us, half laughing, we massaged and comforted poor Ned. This is staged through electrical burns. <laughs> Who was swearing like one possessed. He kept saying damnation over and over again. Um, and then just then, lifted off by the tide's final undulations, the Nautilus left its coral bed. Boom. Okay, <laughs> absolutely shocking. Very good. So, some nice little, <laughs> some nice little stories. But um, again, um, they're all episodic, which is which is quite fun. So that's that's quite a good one. Um, the lost continent is obviously the discovery of Atlantis, um, and that happens down here. So um, yeah, lots and lots of interesting sea creatures. Um, so here they say that uh, but beneath my eyes was a town in ruins, demolished, overwhelmed, laid low. Its roofs caved in, its temples pulled down, its arches dislocated, its columns stretching over the earth. In these ruins you could still detect the solid proportions of a sort of Tuscan architecture further off. The remains of a gigantic aqueduct here, sort of kind of Greco-Roman style. The caked highlights of an Acropolis along with the fluid forms of the Parthenon there, the remnants of a wharf as if some bygone port had long ago harboured merchant vessels and triple-tiered war galleys on the shores of some lost ocean. And further still, long rows of collapsing walls, deserted thoroughfares, a whole Pompeii buried under the waters, which Captain Nemo has redirected before my eyes. Where was I? Where was I? I had to find out at all cost. I wanted to speak. I wanted to rip off the copper sphere, imprisoning my head. Bad idea. Um... But Captain Nemo came over to me and stopped me with a gesture. And then picking up a piece of ch chalky stone, he advanced to a balsamic rock and scrawled this one word. Atlantis. Bum, bum, so there we go. Um, so, um, you know, then lots and lots of relevant um, <laughs> stuff. So they go and find Atlantis, which is pretty cool. They find a passage underneath um the um, Ismuth of the Red Sea and get themselves through to the Mediterranean. In fact, that happens before this bit. Um, and also, uh, where's, the, where's the title page called? Um, whee! Um, uh, the shortage of air um, is, is quite a good bit. Um, and then I think the famous, famous, famous scene um, is, you know, the fight with the... Is it this one? The fight with the... Um, 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 the squid. So it's kind of the the la one of the last set pieces, um, which is one that most people know and most people are kind of familiar with. Um, but anyway, they've been on the boat for quite a long time by this point, several several months, possibly even a year, um, and uh, they start talking about um, you know there's you know, about you know sea squids and things like that and then anyway, there's a fearsome commotion in the huge seaweed devil fish caverns i wouldn't be surprised to see some of those monsters what squid ordinary squid from the class cephalopodia <laughs> they're still talking in scientific terms which i quite like um no a devil fish of large dimensions um now i'm not sure if devil fish here is the translation that this particular translator has taken from the original french um so is that is that is that a french thing devil fish um, um, uh, devilfish of large dimension but friendland is no doubt mistaken because I don't see such a thing I'd like to come face to face with one of those devilfish I've heard so much about says Conseil um, uh, those beasts go by the name of Crake or Fake is more like it <laughs> the Canadian replied sarcastically uh, Krakens Conseil shot back um, no one will make me believe Ned Land says um, so a real creature not uh, uh, just not seen at the surface named Archi Tu something Archi uh, not English name for the giant squid so I don't know actually it's really, um, anyway so they talk about whether or not this thing exists for quite a long time 
Okay, so the devilfish is a species of eagle ray. Okay, so that's not that's not it. Um, um, you know, <laughs> another bishop, Pontipion of Bergen, also tells of a devilfish so large a whole cavalry regiment could maneuver on it. Um, so that's what they're talking about there at the moment. Um, and then they get, you know, the devilfish seems to be conflated with the squid. So um, anyway, um, uh, eight tentacles quivered in the water like a nest of snakes. Um, wasn't its mouth a real parrot's beak of fearsome size? Um, so, um, and then <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a quite, quite clever, this is, this is quite funny. Um, <laughs> So, so Ned and Aranax are arguing about it, right? Um, and then, um, 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 <laughs> what's not revealed to the reader straight away in classic Jules Verne style is that Conseil is, Conseil is looking out of the window at a giant squid um, <laughs> and relating it. So, so, how long was it? The Canadian asked. Uh, was it about six meters? <laughs> Says Conseil, who was stationed at the window. Uh, Precisely, I said. <laughs> They're just having a debate. Um, wasn't its head, uh, Cosawena, crowned by eight tentacles that quivered in the water like a nest of snakes? Exactly. That's exactly what it looks like. <laughs> and uh, weren't its eyes prominently placed and considerably large? Yes, yes, that's exactly right. And wasn't its mouth a real parrot's beak but of fearsome size? <laughs> exactly right, Conso. Correct, 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 correct. Uh, well, with all due respect, Master, Conso replied, <laughs> if this isn't, if this isn't Burger Squid, it's at least one of his close relatives. And then they suddenly realise he's looking at something. Um, <laughs> they look out the window. Um, uh, what an awful animal, I uh, exclaimed to everyone. Anyway, I stared in my turn and couldn't help keep back a moment of revulsion. Before my eyes, there quivered a horrible monster worthy of a place amongst the most far-fetched teratological legends. I don't even know what teratological means. That, that's a word, isn't it? Um, so... Um, the name uh, so Archituthus is the name of a giant squid. It's thought to fight with sperm whales. Okay, uh, so our windows really needed on the submarine. <laughs> well, I think they should have. Yeah, you know, for the same reason they use they're useful on a spaceship, so we can see what we're looking at. Um, it's interesting that you know most of the um, yeah you know, you know, these early submarines did have windows, so you could see what was going on. Um, although a, 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 some uh, you know windows aren't particularly useful on submarines, are they? Um, although the ones that go down to the bottom, they've got little tiny little porthole things, haven't they? So you can see out. You know, the the, the wanting us to see um, uh, see out. You know, when you go somewhere, uh, I think is a fairly basic human drive. Um, so teratology is the study of abnormality. Okay, all evil henchmen also have windows into aquariums. So yeah, do is it is an aquarium. Yeah, is that does that go alongside the classical literature and the classical music as a sign of an evil baddie? Uh, so if you've got the aquarium, you're clearly deranged, right? <laughs> Blue Ganymede, I have this in French on my Kindle. Which chapter are we in? Um, we are in uh, the Devilfish, chapter eighteen is on this list here of the second part. I don't know if that helps. Um, so anyway, so um, you know, there's there's basically a oh, I've gone too fast past it. Um, um, there we go. Uh, it was a, there we go. It was a squid of colossal dimensions, fully eight meters long. It was traveling backward with tremendous speed in the same direction as the Nautilus. It gazed with enormous staring eyes that were tinted sea green. Its eight arms, or more accurately, feet, were rooted in its head, which has earned these animals the name cephalopod. Its arms stretched a distance twice the length of its body and were writhing like the serpentine hair of the Furies. You could plainly see its 250 suckers <laughs> arranged over the inner side of the tentacles and shaped like semispheric capsules. Sometimes these suckers fastened the lounge window by creating vacuums against it. And the monster's mouth, a beak made of horn and shaped like that of a parrot, opened and closed vertically. Its tongue, also of a horny substance, and armed with several rows of sharp teeth, would flicker out from between these genuine shears. What a freak of nature! A bird's beak on a mollusk. Its body was spindle-shaped and swollen in the middle, a fleshy mass that must have weighed 20,000 to 25,000 kilograms. Very precise measurement there. 
Um, its unstable colour would change with tremendous speed as the animal grew irritated, passing successfully from bluish gay to reddish brown. But what was irritating this mollusk? No doubt the presence of the Nautilus itself. Um, anyway, so um, yeah, they're, they're safe inside the um, um, <laughs> safe inside the Nautilus for now until bam bam bam. Um, the monsters are keeping pace with them, and they were moving at moderate speed. And all at once, the Nautilus stopped, and the jolt made it tremble through its entire framework. Um, the Nautilus was still afloat, but it was no longer in motion. The blades of its propeller weren't churning the waves. Um, and then eventually, Captain Nemo turns up in the lounge. Um, and hadn't seen him for a while, and he looked gloomy to me. Um, it's an unusual assortment of devilfish, or squids, or octopuses, or something. Octopi? Octopuses? I don't know. And we're going to fight them, uh, says Nemo. At close quarters? Yes, sir, our propeller is jammed. I think the horn-covered mandibles of one of these squids are entangled in the blades, and that's why we aren't moving. So what are you going to do? Rise to the surface and slaughter the vermin. So the funny, th funny thing is here, up until this point, Captain Nemo has been, the sea is a wonderful thing, and all the creatures in it are wonderful things. And though I eat some of them, you know, the sea services all my needs. Until, until one of them has the temerity to jam up his submarine, in which case it suddenly becomes vermin, and it must be executed. Um, so anyway, the electric bullets are ineffective against that soft flesh where they don't meet enough resistance to go off. So we will attack the beast with axes. So it's a, it's a hand to hand fist fight with a massive squid. Um, and harpoon, sir, the Canadian said, if you don't turn down my help, I accept it, Mr. Land. So um, anyway, so they, they surface the Nautilus. They surface the Nautilus. Um, um, stationed on the top steps, one of the seamen undid the bolts of the hatch, but he scarcely unscrewed the nuts when the hatch flew up with tremendous violence. Um, obviously pulled open by the suckers of a devilish arm, and instantly one of those long arms glided like a snake into the opening, and twenty others were quivering above. With a sweep of the act, Captain Nemo chopped off this fierce and tentacle which slid writhing down the steps. <laughs> That's quite a good vision, isn't it? Uh, but just as we were crowding each other to reach the platform, two more arms lashed the air, swooped on the seaman stationed in front of Captain Nemo, and carried the fellow away with irresistible violence. Oh no! Um, so yeah, so why didn't why didn't Captain Nemo just switch on the exterior electrocution? That that might have worked. Um, didn't even try. No, we're going to go out there and fight it hand to hand. Um, I wonder why the translator went devil fish into the octopus. It's a good question, Alan. What a scene! Seized by the tentacle and glued to its suckers, the unfortunate man was swinging in the air at the mercy of this enormous appendage. And he gasped, he choked, and he yelled, Help! Help! Mayday! Mayday! In French. Uh, these words, pronounced in French, left me deeply stunned. Um, so I had to, I had a fellow country, I had a fellow countryman on board, perhaps several, um, and I'll hear his harrowing plea for the rest of my life. Um, Jules Verne has used up his uh, entire collection of, you know, his entire allocation of uh, exclamation marks in this particular sentence. Um, but the poor fellow was done for. Who could tear him from such a powerful grip? Um, well, <laughs> haven't tried yet. <laughs> Even so, Captain Nemo rushed at the devilfish with a sweep of his axe, hewed one more of his arms. His chief officer struggled furiously with other monsters crawling up the nautilus sides. The crew battled with flailing axes, and the Canadian Conseil and I sank our weapons into these fleshy masses. An intense musky odour filled the air. It was horrible. <laughs> yes, Mayday is French. It's Mayday, which is, uh, please help me, obviously. Um, so anyway, so there's the poor French dude being picked up, and everybody else is chopping around at the, uh, at the things. Um, um, for an instant, I thought the poor man entwined by the devil fish might be torn loose from its powerful suction. Uh, but just as Captain Nemo and his officer rushed at it, the animal shot off a spout of blackish liquid um, and it blinded us. And when this cloud had dispersed, the liquid was gone. And so was my poor fellow countryman. So, um, so yeah, I'm not quite sure what that is. It kind of looks like a squid or an octopus, doesn't it? It's a bit of a bit of a thing. Um, so, um, oddly enough, I wouldn't have thought an octopus squirting ink in the air would work very well. Um, I mean, it's it's a, it's a valid defence in the water, isn't it? An octopus ink. 
but it doesn't <laughs> would it work in the air you know <laughs> i'm not sure if that would work um so um the pen is mightier than the sword it is indeed um so um anyway so now another one attacks ned uh, and he's about to be cut in half by the beak uh but captain nemo got there first okay so i got inked on my first night dive it's very effective underwater yeah i can imagine it is um uh, and his axe disappeared between the two enormous mandibles and the canadian miraculously saved stood plunged his harpoon all the way into the devil fish's triple heart have they got triple hearts squids and octopuses triple hearts um tit for tat captain nemo told the canadian i owed it to myself anyway so now there's a bit of mutual respect between um captain nemo and ned anyway so they they they, they, they deal with that um Frank Miner says yes. Okay, so that's interesting on the triple heart business. Any time I ever saw an octopus, that must have been quite a weird thing. Actually, it's got inked on my first night dive. Very cool. Um, <laughs> fine, you take the pen. I'll take Stormbringer. WGB. <laughs> anyway, so that's that. And then, um, so you know, they've lost a few, um, a few crewmen, but you know, they they fought off the, um, um, they fought off the. Um, um you know the whatever they are devil fish squid octopus things um um anyway so he's lost another companion um and they you know had to kind of um um yeah, has to moan that um uh, which which is there we go so octopuses have blue blood three hearts and a donut shaped brain there we go um apparently devil fish is a name sometimes given to an octopus okay well there we go Anyway, so eventually they um, they move off. Now, Captain Nemo at this point basically sort of loses his mind a bit, <laughs> okay? Um, and the other guys are basically thinking now about trying to escape. Um, and yeah, they basically have another debate about what they're going to do. Um, and um, so, and Captain Nemo presents Professor Aranax with a manuscript written in several languages, uh, which contains a complete summary of all of his work. Um, um, and the last surviving man on Nautilus will throw this contrivance into the sea and they will go for wherever the waves carry it. Um, so Captain Nemo seems to have suddenly decided, right, this is it, <laughs> done enough. Um, so anyway, so they, they have a bit of an argument about you know, the, the nature of freedom and slavery and stuff. Um, and they're very near to New York again, I assume here, Long Island. Um, um, and then, um, you know, so they think about jumping ship, but the weather's just too bad. Um, and then um, they, they get turned about and they get headed back across the Atlantic. And then um, um, there's a there's a hurricane going on the surface, but of course, beneath the surface of the sea, um, then uh, then off they go. Um, so, you know, then they 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 um they truck across the the atlantic for a bit so are you going to cover the idea where he came from and why he's so anti-land life so yeah so where is that bit I, i'm just trying to find it um so where where is so okay so he's heading across the atlantic towards the british isles which is which is right um um oh, apparently the squid's can't live if they lose one of their hearts. It's not all interconnected. System. It's an odd design, isn't it? Have three hearts, but you're entirely dependent on all three working at the same time. Um, so, um, and then they, they do come across this warship um, now towards the end, okay? Um, and um, the warship Avenger. Um, and. Um, so there we go. So um, to start with, the prominent bulge on the sea caught my attention. OK, so that so. Um, that's right, the sunken sunken wreck um, uh, of a ship that uh, sank uh, 74 years before uh, after a heroic battle. And it went to the bottom with 356 people aboard uh with its flag nailed up on the after it appeared beneath the waves long live the republic um so it did mention his his co-man when he was 
off the coast of Ceylon. Okay, let's, um, let's see if we can just find that because that's a good bit of context. Now that we're skipping around the book a bit. Um, Ceylon's mentioned there. That's an early reference to it. That's the pearl. I'm not sure. No, I didn't seem to mention it here, but um, uh, difficult to tell in that one. So there's the devil fish again. We've done that one. Um, so anyway, so the accounts the wreck, and then. Um, my eyes never left him, hand stretched forward, so he completed the proud wreck with blazing eyes. I would never learned who he was, where he came from, where he was heading, but more and more I could sense the distinction between the man and the scientist. It was no ordinary misanthropy, misanthropy that kept Captain Nemo and his companions sequestered inside the Nautilus plating, but the hate so monstrous or so sublime in the passing years could never weaken it. So, you know, you get the impression something very bad happened to you, Captain Nemo and crew. Um, and then they surface again and something is attacking them. Um, and they can see a ship, you know, six miles away. Um, and it's some sort of warship. <laughs> it could be the homework in your end of stream exam. That's right. Um, why did Captain Nemo... Um... Okay, Captain Nemo is from Bundelkhand in India. Um, this is like flicking to the last chapter of Who Done It. Yeah, I know. Um, anyway, so um, the ship is getting larger and they're not sure which... Um, which type of ship it is um and then then the waters are splashing around them so they're, they're under fire by cannon um um so um so they now speculate that they encounter with the abraham lincoln from all those months ago um you know has been reported back and now they know that it's actually a submarine and they're actually firing on it um so what would Captain what what would Captain Nemo do? Um, anyway, so shells are falling around them, um, and some would ricochet and vanish into sea at considerable difference, but none of them reach the Nautilus. Then it, you know, it's revealed to be an ironclad uh, battleship, um, and despite the violent cannon, Captain Nemo had yet to appear. Ned Land pulled out his handkerchief to wave it in the air, but he had barely unfolded it when he was felled by an iron fist. And despite his great strength, he tumbled to the deck. Scum, says Captain Nemo. Do you want to be nailed to the Nautilus's spur before it charges that ship? OK, so Captain Nemo is a bit upset by all this. Um, his face pale from some spasm of his heart. He must have stopped beating for an instant. His pupils were hideously contracted. His voice no longer speaking, it was bellowing. And bending from the waist, he shook the Canadian by the shoulders. Um, um, and then... You know, then he shakes his fist at the approaching ship. Oh, ship of uncursed nation, you know who I am. He shouts in his powerful voice, and I don't need your colours to recognise you. Look, I'll show you mine. And he unfurls a black flag, like the one he apparently planted at the South Pole. Um, just then a shell hit the Nautilus's hull, obliquely failed to breach it, ricocheted near the captain and vanished into the sea. Go below, you and your companions, go below. What are you going to do, attack that ship? I am going to sink it. Bum, bum, bum. You wouldn't. I will, says Captain Nemo. You're ill-advised to pass judgment on me, sir. Fate has shown you weren't meant to see. The attack has come and our reply will be dreadful. Get back inside. Um, anyway, so um, Captain Nemo has basically taunted them. Shoot you, demented vessel. But this isn't the place you'll perish. I don't want your wreckage mingling with that of the Avenger. Um... Um, and he basically, you know, he's setting himself up as judge and jury here. I am the law, I'm the tribunal. I have witnessed, and here we go, so there are my oppressors. Thanks to them, I've witnessed the destruction of everything I loved, cherished and venerated my homeland, wife, children, father and mother. There lies everything I hate, not a word out of you. Um, so so that's, is, is that as close as we get to actually Nemo's motivations, that, you know, his, his homeland, everything he cares about has been destroyed by something on land um 
And um, anyway, so eventually the vessel, there, there, there basically is a fight between um, the Nautilus and this attack, uh, attacking ship. Um, and um, basically the Nautilus rams it. Okay, it was, uh, there had been a collision, but it was comparatively mild. I could feel the penetrating force of the steel spur. I could hear the scratchings and scrapings carried away with driving power. The Nautilus had passed through the vessel's mass like a sailmaker's needle through canvas. Um, they rushed to the lounge to see what's going on. Um, and the ship is sinking. Okay. An enormous mass was sinking beneath the waves and the Nautilus, missing none of its death throes, was descending into the depths with it. Ten metres away I could see its gaping hull into which water was rushing with the sound of thunder and then its double rows of cannons and railings, its deck covered with dark, quivering shadows. The water was rising. Poor men leapt into the shrouds, clung to the mast, writhed beneath the waters. It was a human anthill that an invading sea had caught by surprise. Yep. Oppressors wanted his technology and he wouldn't play and they killed his family. He, he's, he's got a point. You know, that's very true. Um... And then they, basically they watch it as it goes down. The compressed air inside the craft sends its decks flying as if powder stores had been ignited. The thrust of the waters was so great that the Nautilus swerved away. And then the dark mass disappeared, and with it a crew of corpses dragged under by fearsome eddies. I turned to Captain Nemo. This dreadful executioner, true archangel of hate, was still staring. And when it was all over, Captain Nemo headed to the door of his stateroom, opened it and entered. And I followed him with my eyes. On the rear panelling, beneath the portraits of his heroes... I saw the portrait of a still youthful woman with two little children. Captain Nemo stared at them for a few moments, stretched out his arms to them, sank to his knees and melted into sobs. So there you go. That's that's Captain Nemo's motivation. Basically, everything was taken from him. So he's taking it back from everyone else. Um, and the last words of Captain Nemo, um, as, as this chapter describes... Um, Anyway, so um, the Nautilus shoots off at high speed for some reason. Um, and he's now heading northeast and he ends up in um, the, the far part of the North Sea, which is off UK and um, Scandinavia. Um, um, not, uh, Captain Nemo does not appear. Um, and um, they basically say, we are going to escape. We are going to escape. We're going to definitely going to escape. Finally, going to escape. Um, you know, so and they're basically going to pinch the skiff and row away. Um, and Ned chimes in. Um, the sea's rough, the wind's blowing hard, but a twenty-mile run in the Nautilus longboat doesn't scare me. <laughs> Rowing twenty miles, really? Uh, <laughs> it's quite quite weird. Anyway, so um, they basically plan it, um, and they're about to pinch the skiff. When um, Captain Nemo suddenly appears again and shouts, um, Oh, almighty God, enough, enough. And that's it. That's the last thing he says. Um, and then clearly something else has gone wrong. So there's the shouts from the crew of the Nautilus. Um, and, um, you yeah, know, they're prepared to fight their way out at this point. Um, and then, but the crew isn't worried about them. The crew's worried about something externally and they shout the words, Maelstrom, Maelstrom. And the Maelstrom um, is basically a current. It is, it's a genuine thing. It's a current off the Norwegian coast, which is a, effectively a whirlpool. And it can suck down ships, or at least it could suck down ships in those days. Um, I don't know how dangerous it is now to modern shipping. <laughs> it's the Thargoids, yeah, the Maelstrom. Well, there's no new imaginative ideas, you know. If you want something scary and fearsome sounding, um, Maelstrom will do, right? Uh, so I don't know if the uh, the law people on Elite Dangerous know that they're secretly channeling Jules Verne, but uh, you know, hopefully they do know that they are. Uh, anyway, so uh, they're in the dangerous waters off the Norwegian coast. Now that, that's a real thing, the Norwegian Maelstroms. I don't know how how dangerous they are. Whether this has been exaggerated a bit for effect, but um, so anyway, so what happens is the Nautilus ends up in the Maelstrom. Um, whether it had been sent accidentally or deliberately by Captain Nemo, I'm not sure. Um, anyway, it gets trapped in the whirlpool. And then, you know, the ship begins to... Dis basically, this the ship begins to break up. Um, 
put it like this says so commander seed i either void them <laughs> um and then basically professor aranax um you know, he hadn't finished speaking when a cracking sound occurred. The nuts gave way, ripping out of its socket, and the skiff was hurled like a stone from a sling in the midst of the vortex. My head struck against an iron timber, and with this violent shock, I lost consciousness. So whatever happened to the Nautilus, Professor Aranax didn't uh, witness the end of the Nautilus. It appears that the, um, the, the the ship was breaking up, but it's not entirely sure. It is borrowed from early Dutch Maelstrom Whirlpool. Um, modern Dutch is Maelstrom from... Well, maelstrom is a is a <laughs> excellent word. Why did they change that? Uh, from Malin to well around the grind. Um, there we go. Okay. So miraculous escape never explained. Anyways, then that's the conclusion. So basically, Professor Aronex never finds out whether or not the Nautilus survived or not, and what happened to Professor Nemo. Um, uh, what happened that night? How the skiff escaped from the maelstrom's fearsome eddies? How Ned Land Consul got out of the world? But I am unable to say. Maybe it was all a dream. Um, when I regained consciousness, I was lying in a fisherman's hut on one of the Lofoten Islands. My two companions, safe and sound, were at my bedside, clasped my hands. Um, just now, we couldn't even dream of returning to France because travel between Upper Norway and the South is limited. I don't know if that was a thing between the, at the time. Um, so we had to wait for the arrival of a steamboat. Um, will anyone believe me? I don't know. Ultimately, it's unimportant. What can I now assert is that I've earned the right to speak of these seas, beneath which in less than 10 months, there you go, that's how long it was, 10 months, uh, I cleared 20,000 leagues of the underwater tour of the world. And what happened to the Nautilus? Did it withstand the Maelstrom's clutches? Is Captain Nemo alive? Is he still under the ocean pursuing his frightful program of revenge? Or did he stop after that latest mass execution? Will the wave someday deliver that manuscript that contains his life story? Will I learn the man's name? Will the nationality of the stricken warship tell us the nationality of Captain Nemo? I hope so. Otherwise, that his powerful submersible has defeated the sea inside its most dreadful whirlpool, and the Nautilus has survived where so many other ships have perished. If this is the case, and Captain Nemo still inhabits the ocean, his adopted country, may the hate be appeased in that fierce heart. May the contemplation of so many wonders extinguish the spirit of vengeance in him. And may the executioner pass away and the scientist continue his peaceful exploration of the seas. If his destiny is strange, is also sublime. Haven't I encompassed it myself? Didn't I lead ten months of this otherworldly existence? Thus to that question asked six thousand years ago in the book of Ecclesiastes. Interesting choice. Who can fathom the soundless depths? Two men out of all humanity have earned the right to do so. Captain Nemo and I. Bam, bam, bam. And that's the end of 20,000 leagues under the sea. Um, why didn't Aranax just ask Ned and Conseil? They weren't knocked out. Um, so, I don't know. Good question. You could have done. <laughs> they weren't a proper gentleman. It didn't count. Uh, fine. Yeah. Perfectly good rationalisation. Um... Jules Verne cop out there, Miraculous Escape, never explained. Um, and spoiler, apparently he comes up years later in Mysterious Island, which I gave up on Extremely Tears. I haven't, I haven't, um, I haven't read that one, so maybe I won't. Um, but there, there, my friends, I present you with Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. I mean, it is, it is a good book. It's a, I mean, it's a foundational science fiction epic. I mean, you've got, um, you know, weird, um, brooding characters, um, You've got shipwrecks, you've got kidnappings, you've got weird electric stuff going on, venture under the sea, wacky sea creatures, you know, um, rammings, ship combat, stabbings, you know, you, <laughs> it's full of good stuff, right? Um, in terms of in terms of a story, I think, I mean, it's definitely up there as one of the masterpieces of early science fiction. I, I, it's, it's, it's a bit long, I think. I mean, compared to some of Jules Verne's other stuff, it's it's a bit long, but it does it does crack on with the storytelling mostly. There are a few areas where it's kind of like, you know, particularly when he's classifying sea creatures. But um, there's a, there's enough good set pieces in there that to keep you going, you know. Um, so, I, I, I yeah, I think we've given it four weeks, so <laughs> it's longer than we've given anything else. Um, and I think yeah, like you say, you've got to see it in period. Obviously, for its time, it must have been astonishing. Um, and Verne was doing a lot of research um, and showing off a bit in places, I think, yes, but um, uh, definitely a bit. Um, but um, <laughs> didn't need an editor, did he enough of the fish descriptions? Um, we did <laughs> we did study it in depth, but the, that's very good as well. Um, so so that's so that quite good. And that's coming from a marine biology student, yes. Uh, so, 
<laughs> if you're a geofish, I can see it. But I like the fact it's got a, you know, the Nautilus itself is a character in the story. It's something that I did try to pay a bit of homage to when I did the shape with. I wanted the Mobilus in my books to be a character in the stories that when the ship was lost, uh, again, slight spoilers there. Um, yeah, and, and when the Nautilus is lost here, um, you know, it's just like, oh no. <laughs> We've lost the we've lost the underwater submarine as well. You know, it's a character in the story, right? Um, and that's 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 an important thing that we have a sort of attachment to the ship, um, not just the people on board. So that's a, that's another aspect. You know, in the same way that um, you know, I suppose in Star Wars, um, you know, we've got an attachment to the Millennium Falcon in in a certain way. Um, you know, it, it's it's more than just a bucket of bolts. It's a ship with a character. And things like that, I think, are quite important. So, I thought the Nautilus when the red shade with a nice reference. So, yeah, so there's a few bits in in shade with that are actually, you know, I've channeled um, um, a bit of a bit of twenty thousand leagues under the sea. So, um, so that's quite fun. Um, it's funny actually how sometimes you subconsciously make reference to things. I mean, the Mobilus being called the Mobilus was a very specific choice, but um, there's a few other bits in there. I'm thinking mm, actually, I've I've, I've thought. Um, <laughs> Do you think Jules Verne ever fished for compliments? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, but there we go. So, um, I, I, I think it stands up pretty well. It, it, it's a bit disjointed in places. It could do with a jolly good edit um, by modern standards, but you know that's by modern standards. So, um, and if it was serialized week by week. Um, I've never tried writing a book week by week. I think that would be quite hard to keep the pacing the same. So, um, um, so uh, <laughs> reshape, but it's a bit like Aranax discovering the Nautilus and working out how it goes. Yeah, so I, I'd, I'd spun that around a different way um, in the sense that um, the people on board the Mobilus didn't really understand how the Mobilus worked at first and they were trying to figure it out. And the Mobilus was not a modern ship it was an ancient ship that had kind of been rediscovered but you know it's yeah you play around with things in a different way um it's kind of all kind of good stuff um so there we go what do we what do we think overall i mean it's it's, it's a positive experience it's been my favorite book so far much better than master of the world says frank minor yep come on see do i like the way they finally discover the radio oh were they <laughs> in shape with the megahertz yeah <laughs> the megahertz i don't know that like the sound of that <laughs> um so um, yeah, trying to trying to discover high technology in a culture where high technology doesn't exist it did present me with a few challenges as to how I was going to treat that particular problem. But hopefully, I got it reasonably right. Um, so um, so that's that that was quite good fun. But no, I think twenty thousand. I I think it's pretty good. Um, um, the other one, the other Jules Verne that's worth a mention here, of course, is um, Journey to the Center of the Earth. Now that one is a good story, but it does drag on quite a lot in the middle okay um it does drag on quite a long time in the middle it and it takes quite a long time to get going as well uh, but eventually it does get good so if you do want to read um um journey to the center of the earth i mean it's 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 way more wackily inaccurate because it kind of implies that there's there is a way to get to the center of the earth uh, not that they do actually find the way well they find a way all sorts of places um so um but it's it's quite a hard listen it's it's less good than this i would say um so um you know it's worth it if you're into jules Verne, but it's not um uh it's 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 not as good as twenty thousand leagues on sea i would say this is probably jules Verne's best work um other than the endless list of fish <laughs> gonna be the third limp uh but some good set pieces you know battle with squids and the wrecks and the, and the smashing other boats down and the maelstroms and you know, Pearl's a great pie, going to see Atlantis. You know, there's, there's a lot of good stuff in there, a lot of good imagination, so I think that's quite good. Now, um, Alan did have um, some suggestions, actually, for what we might want to read next. So let, I'm just going to pop up on the other screen here for a moment while I figure it out. Uh, what did you suggest for me, Alan? Um, I'm just trying to remember. Because um, there's there's some slightly more modern bits and pieces on there, um, so there's a bit of Isaac Asimov. Now he's a bit of a master of 
um, sci-fi. So let's go back to Gutenberg and see what's available there. And and yeah, as some of you have been requesting something a bit more modern, which I, I get. So let's have a look for Asimov and see what pops up there. Okay, so um, it hasn't got his like super duper famous stuff. Um, but uh, youth apparently now I'm just trying to remember what this one's about um, I have read this one but it was a long 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 time ago can I remember what it's about um, it's not very long um, as I recall uh, it's like 88 kilobytes okay so it's not it's not a huge story um, and then so it's an Isaac Asimov isn't a I think it's an early Isaac Asimov. I think it's something to do with basically a sort of alien human encounter. Um, so, um, so, and it's on Gutenberg. So at the time, it's it's free for us to uh, to go and read. So um, I would go, I was going to suggest maybe this is a good one to get something a little bit more modern. I mean, it's not super modern, but it's a lot more modern than the stuff that we have been looking at. Let's just see if we can find out when this was written. And this will be introduced to, again, somebody who's regarded as quite the master of science fiction. Uh, and it's a bit short compared to um, some of the stuff that we have been reading. So this is 19, 1952. Okay, so I know, <laughs> I know 1952 is still quite a long time ago. It's like 70 years ago. <laughs> but um, um, it's, a, it's an Asimov story of alien characters. And it's quite short. Um um, not Asimov's mystery. So yeah, there are other things we could could um, could try as well. But I was thinking this is a, a bit, maybe a bit of an introduction to Asimov and quite short, um, which which is quite good. So in terms of its length, it's not not a big thing. Um, uh, so I expect that some recent authors protected their stuff better and prevented them going into Gutenberg. So um, we have what else is there in Asimov? It's good for me. It's on Audible. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, worlds within worlds, genetic effects of radiation. So there's, there's, those, those, that's all that we have for Asimov wise. So this is a story that actual Asimov, um, youth is about 35 pages. So you should be able to manage that by next week. Okay. <laughs> so he's a prolific writer, wrote more than edited more than 500 books. He also wrote an estimated 90,000 letters and postcards. I mean, the man's a, man's a machine. Um, that's insane, isn't it? I mean, I, I mean, I've worked out, I've written now how many books have I written now? Probably about 13 or 14 books in the last 13 or 14 years. So I'm averaging about one book a year um, of about 10,000 words each, 100,000 words each. So, so I've probably written in the order of 1.3 to 1.4 million words that have been published now, right? So <laughs> we're near that. 500 books. I mean, how do you hell do you write 500 books? I have no idea. Um, it's just, just insane. Um, so anyway, so are we are we happy with that? Shall we shall we do Youth by Isaac Asimov? Okay, Isaac Asimov being a master, another another master of um, thing. Make them really short. Yeah, my books are quite long, I suppose. Uh, so that's quite good. But I, I like long stories. It takes me a while to, um, um, you know bring all my characters in and do all the machinations and the plots and the and the stuff so that, that's that's me that's how I write but yeah I'm not I'm, I'm not an Isaac Asimov but um um one of my short stories was favorably compared by a couple of people to an Isaac Asimov story so um that that's most likely a bit of smoke being blown up my my you know by them uh, but um you know who knows we'll see um I'm um, if there, there, I do have some short stories on my own that I can uh, uh, <laughs> I can volunteer to be fodder for being read because I can give you those for free anyway. Um, so because um, I can whack it on the Discord and you can have a read of those. So, um, but um, let's let's give youth a go. Okay, so that's your homework for next week. Read youth by um, by Isaac Asimov. Thank you for Alan for the suggestion, and we'll swap to Isaac Asimov as a bit more of a modern author. Let's just give you to give you a flavour of Isaac Asimov. Uh, on, on Wikipedia. Um, how long has he he's been dead? Not that long ago, was it? Um, so okay, 1920 to 1992. Um, 
one of the big three science fiction writers, along with Robert A. Heinlein and Arthur C. Clarke. So, okay, so this is the big three of modern science fiction. Uh, so that's quite good. I don't know, have we got any... Is there any Arthur C. Clarke on Gutenberg? Probably not. No, we've got a bit of Arthur Conan Doyle, though, so... That would be quite good. So um, um, there's no Heinlein either. Okay, so uh, we'll have to we'll have to stick with a tiny little bit of Asimov. Um, so um, his his books have been published in nine of the ten major categories of the Dewey Decimal Classification. So Asimov. Okay, so um, and he died of AIDS, didn't he? Oh, I didn't realise that. Um, there were bits of Twenty Thousand Leagues that reminded me of Arthur C. Clarke. Yeah, there, there's lots of Philip K. Now Philip K. Dick is a bit weird as well, so we'll um, we'll get into him as well. But let's go with Asimov, Youth by Asimov. Okay, so that's your homework next week, my friends. Be good. Um, and go read that one. Um, we will uh, we will dump uh, we will dive into youth with uh, Isaac Asimov and see if we can give uh, give him a first airing. See how it is. Youth it is. Um, um, Mr. Spaceship must be. Must be PD by now. Paid? Paid by now? Um, youth it is. Youth it is. Youth is a good thing. Um, uh, Mark Leinster is on Gutenberg, but I don't know him. Interesting. Okay. Um, so there's plenty plenty of other science fiction out there, um, but there we go. So that's your homework. Youth by Isaac Asimov. 35 pages. I expect you all have done that by next week. See you next week, my friends. Have a fantastic week ahead. Be good. Um, and as always, my friends, right on. And... Uh, Whatever you do, don't take your submarine into the maelstrom, okay? It's not going to work out well for you. <laughs> take care, and I will see you next week. Be good, and thank you for joining the writing stream. See you soon, my friends. Take care now. Bye-bye.